Welcome to the Master's House.
got home from work and I was getting ready to uh, come to Bible study and I was tired. Just to be honest, I was tired. And, uh, man, I'm not even started yet and it feels like I'm out of breath. <laughs> I'm out of shape. No wonder I'm tired. Uh, and then all of a sudden, in the silence, in the midst of the quietness, I heard Brother Hal. How many love Brother Hal? 
And Brother Hal, and I'm talking about, I don't think we've sung this song since uh, the Golden Voices way back, uh, back in California when they used to sing, and I'm sure we've sang it before, the, uh, bef before then, but I don't even remember the last time we've heard this song. We certainly have not heard this song in this house. And there was Brother Hal in the midst of the quietness saying, I don't. You know where I'm going, right? Boy, Susie says, I don't. And you know how Brother Hal does it. He, you know, he lays it out there. I don't feel no ways tired. Amen. What a testimony today. Amen. I don't feel no ways tired. I've come too far from where God has brought me from. I'm not going to turn back. I'm going to continue to go forward in the things of the Lord. And man, I started to get excited about hearing Brother Hal sing this song. And then, I don't know, I'm kind of weird the way my mind uh, travels. Because right in the middle of this song, there's Brother Bill. And I don't think Brother Bill sings in that song. Does he? Yes, he does. But Brother Bill was singing a whole different song. <laughs> to me, they just, it was a medley. It just meshed together. And uh, there was Brother Bill singing, you know what? He didn't bring me this far to leave me. He didn't teach me to swim, to let me drown. He didn't bring us home in us to move away. He didn't build us up to let us down or something like that, right? All I know, there's some promises in a letter written a long time ago, right? You guys remember those songs? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And uh, just got to started getting excited about the things of the Lord. And then all of a sudden, I heard my pastor. And pastor preached a message. Oh, pfft. I can't remember if it was in California, if it was over there on 124 Delaware. And uh, it was faint, yet pursuing. So you guys remember that message? Yes. Years ago. I don't even remember uh, the ins and outs of his message. I just remembered that. And that's where we're going to uh, allow the Lord to minister into my heart today, okay? Yeah. From Brother Hal to Brother Bill to our pastor. And so I've been meditating on all these things. And our text is found in Judges the seventh uh, and the eighth chapter. And a lot of times we study out the seventh chapter and we talk about Gideon and how uh, the Lord called Gideon and he laid out the fleece and all those things. And I don't want to spend a lot of uh, time on this um, because I want to get to the, the, the part of the story that we don't pay a whole lot of attention to. And, uh, you know, he started out with an army of 32,000, and the Lord said, that's too many. And uh, so then they pronounced, hey, the fearful and the afraid go home, and 22,000 took off. So now he's left with about 10,000. He has this army, and I believe it was uh, uh, Brother Garrett spoke a, a message eight, nine months ago about, about Gideon, wasn't it, Brother Garrett? And did a really wonderful job in talking about it and uh, what it took to be one of those that uh, at the water test were those that lap water like a dog, and those that didn't, and how they were separated, and those were sent home, and there was only 300 left. And so what I want to do is pick up the story. You know, uh, they separated themselves into three companies of 100, and the uh, Midianites were there in the Valley of Jezreel, and they, they went on three separate sides or three separate points, and they each had a pitcher and a trumpet and uh, a torch. And at the appropriate time, they were there gathered around about the camp. They broke their pitchers, blew the trumpets, and shouted, what? That's right, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And uh, that's where I want to pick up. All right? And the 300 blew the trumpets. This is uh, verse 22. And the Lord set every man's sword against his fellows, so the Midianites turned against one another, even throughout all the host. And the host fled to Beshida and Zerath, and to the border of Abimelech, unto Tabath. And the men of Israel gathered themselves together out of Naphtali, and out of Asher, and out of Manasseh, and they pursued after the Midianites. And Gideon sent messengers throughout all Mount Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midians, and take before them the waters 
take them at the waters of Bethbara and of Jordan. And the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and took the waters of Bethbara and of Jordan. And they took two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb, and they slew Oreb upon the rock of Oreb, and they slew Zeb. They slew at the winepress of Zeb and pursued Midian and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side of Jordan. Continuing on into the eighth chapter. And the men of Ephraim said unto him, Why hast thou served us thus that thou calledest not when thou wentest to fight the Midianites? And they did chide with him sharply, and he said unto them, What have I done now in comparison to you? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Bezer? God hath delivered unto your hands the princes of Midian. And what was I able to do in comparison of you? And their anger was abated toward him when he had said that. And Gideon came on to the Jordan and passed over he and the 300 men that were with him faint, yet pursuing them. And he said unto the men of Sukkoth, Give, I pray thee, loaves of bread unto the people that follow me, for they be faint. For I am pursuing after Zeba and Zalmunna, the kings of Midian. And the princes of Suku said, Are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna now in thy hand, that we should give thee bread unto thy army? And Gideon said, Therefore, when the Lord hath delivered Zeba and Zalmunna into my hand, I will tear your flesh with the thorns of the wilderness and with briars. And he went up thence to Peniel. And spake unto them likewise, and the men of Penuel answered him as the men of Sukkoth, and answered him, and he spake unto the men of Penuel, saying, When I come unto thee in peace, I will break down this tower. Now Zeba and Zamuna were in Kedor, Karkor, and their host was with them about 15,000 men, all that were left of the host of the children of the east, for there fell 120,000 men that drew the sword. And Gideon went up by the way of them that dwelt in the tents of the east, of Nobah and Jogbahah. Jogbaha. I should have just skipped all the names. I'm just tearing it up. Uh, where are we at? Verse 12. And Ziba and Zamumna fled and pursued after them and took the two kings of Midian, Ziba and Zamumna, and discomfited all the hosts. And Gideon, the son of Joash, returned from the battle before the sun was up and caught a young man of the men of Sekuth. And inquired of him, and described, and he described unto him the princes of Sukkoth and the elders thereof, even threescore and seventeen men. And he came unto the men of Sukkoth and said, Behold, Zeba and Zamuna, whom you did, abrade me, saying, Are the hands of Zeba and Zamuna in your, your hand, and we will give you bread? And he took the elders of the city, and the thorns of the wilderness and briars, and with them he taught the men of Sukkoth, and beat down the tower of Penuel, and slew the men of the city. Then said he unto Zeba and Zemunah, What manner of men are these whom ye slew at Tabor? And they answered, As thou art, so were they. Each one resembled the children of a king. And he said, They were my brethren, even the sons of my mother, as the Lord liveth. If ye had saved them alive, I would not slay you. And he said unto Jether his firstborn, Up and slay them. But he was a youth, and drew not a sword, for he feared, because he was but a youth. Then Zeba and Zemunah, Rise thou yourself, Gideon, and take care of business. So Gideon jumped up and slew him and took the ornaments that were around the camel's necks. And the men of Israel said unto Gideon, Rule over us, thy and thy sons, for you have delivered us from the hand of Midian. Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you, for the Lord shall rule over you. And Gideon said unto them, I desire a request of you that you should give me every man the earrings of his prey, for they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. And they answered, we willingly give them, and they spread out a garment and did cast every man his earrings of this prey. And the weight of the gold of the earrings he was requested was a thousand and seven hundred shekels of gold, besides ornaments and collars and purple raiment that was on the kings of Midian, and beside the chains were about their camels' necks. And Gideon made an ephod thereof and put it in the city, even in Orpha, as all Israel went thither whoring after it, which thing came a snare unto Gideon and to his house. Thus was Midian subdued before the children of Israel, so that they lifted up their heads no more, and the country was in quietness forty years in the days of Gideon. Well, that was hard for, to, for you guys to follow, wasn't it, the way I butchered it? Let me just tell you the story, all right? So Gideon is there. He blows the trumpet with the 300. They're surrounding him, and all of a sudden, 
the, uh, the Midianites there in the valley of Jez Jezreel began to turn on one another and then begin to fight one another. And the 300 came down and then all of a sudden everybody else got excited. They already went home, but all of a sudden those of Asher and all those other countries, uh, tribes got excited about the victory of the Lord. And so they joined in the fight and they began to chase after the Midianites. And then all of a sudden Gideon sends word to the Ephraimites and says, hey, we're coming down this way after the Midianites, and if you come down this way, you could trap them by the waters, and we'll just really rout these guys. So the men of Ephraim got excited about the things of the Lord and the victory of the Lord, and they were no longer afraid of the Midianites, so they came down, and they began just to whoop up on the Midianites. How's that? So then Ephraim, when they come down, they capture two princes. Now they're upset with Gideon. Gideon, why didn't you come and get us and tell us that you were going to go fight against the Midianites? We would have liked to have been a part of the battle. Do you realize that if the Ephraimites would have came down, that they would have been separated just like everybody else? Because the victory was the Lord's, and God only needed 300. He didn't need 32,000. So if 22,000 went away and 10,000 went away, then God didn't need the Ephraimites either. But because Gideon was a smart man, he says, hey, we're not so as important as you Ephraimites. You got these two princes. How great and wonderful is that? And so that appeased him, appeased them. So then Gideon, with his 300, not with the Ephraimites, not with all the other tribes that gathered themselves together to rout the Midianites after God already begun the battle, or let me say that this is where God already began the war, it was 300. The 300 crossed over the Jordan in pursuit of the two kings of Midian. 300. Then it says that the kings of Midian stopped in Kakur, or however you say it, and they had how many? 15,000. Now, getting this 300, they've been up all night. Right? God's performing a great victory, and now they're chasing. Now they're pursuing. And so now... They come across the Jordan. They come to the men of Sukkoth and say, hey, look, we're chasing the Midianites. We're going to get them, but we're tired and we need something, something to eat. And they said, we're not going to give you nothing to eat. Why do you suppose they wouldn't give Gideon anything to eat? Because they were afraid. Listen to their answer. If you had the two kings in your hand, then we might give you something to eat. But I don't know if the kings aren't delivered in your hand, they still may have rule over us that now we betrayed the two kings by giving you something to eat, so we got to cover our own selves, right? Think about it. It doesn't say that. I'm reading into it, but think about it. Why wouldn't they? Because they're still afraid of the kings of Midian. If I help Gideon and the kings of the Midianites win, now I'm going to be subject to the Midianites and they're going to know that I helped Gideon and now they're going to do something to me because I helped their enemy. Think about it, right? Go to the next city. Hey, man, we're pursuing the enemy. We're faint. We're tired. Can you give us something? They answered Gideon the exact same way as the others. And I appreciate Gideon, right? You know what? Because you said this, when I come back with the head of Zumana and Ziva, I'm going to take you guys out and I'm going to whoop you. You realize that's what he said? I'm going to give you a whooping. And then to the other city of Peniel, he says, I'm going to tear down your tower. That's your great glory. I'm going to tear down your tower. Because God's given a great victory here and you're not willing to help. So then the 300 by themselves show up, faint yet pursuing, trusting in the Almighty God, comes to the city where the two kings of the Midianites were. They were still 15,000 strong. The Word of God said 100 and how many? 120,000, 180,000 already fell. Some of them killed themselves. Some of them by the children of Ephraim. Some of them by the other tribes. But now there's 15,000 against 300. You know how many that is? That means I get 50. 
Think about it. Do the math. I get 50. You get 50. There's not even uh, 300 of us here. May, let's say there's 100 of us. That means we get, what, 150, right? We get 150. Praise the Lord. Huh? How many is ready for your 150? So they each get 50. And God delivers them into their hand, into Gideon's hand, into 300 hand. Then Gideon goes back, right? And he comes to the city of Penuel, he tears down the tower, and he whoops up on everybody. And then he takes the, the men of the city of Succoth, takes them out there with the switches and the briars, and gives them a whoop them. The word, or God says he taught them. To me, that means they got a whooping, Right? Then they want to try and turn, Gideon, because you did this great thing and you wrought this great uh, victory against the Midianites, we want to make you king. Gideon says, I am not going to be your king. Neither will any of my sons be your king. The Lord is your king. Amen. Amen. And I want to key in on this second verse, second key verse. Thus was Midian subdued before the children of Israel so that they lifted up their heads no more and the country was quiet for 40 years in the days of Gideon. See, we stop at the battle and we get excited about the, the spirit and the power and the glory and the wonder of Almighty God because he delivered the Midianites in their hand. But the battle is not the end of the war. I'm tired, but praise God he gave us the victory. I'm faint, yet I am pursuing. So I ask you today, what are you pursuing? What are you pursuing? In Galatians, the sixth chapter, in the ninth verse, and that is my key verse, by the way, in Judges, the eighth chapter, in the fourth verse, and Gideon came to Jordan, passed over, and he and the 300 men that were with him faint, yet pursuing. We know in Galatians, the sixth chapter, this is Paul writing his epistle. It says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Now, this scripture is talking about, now when I was thinking about this, I, I automatically came to this scripture, but this scripture is not talking about the same circumstance or the same situation that the Gideon's 300 was. They were physically tired, they were uh, famished, they were thirsty, they had been pursuing, and the thing was they were still going to pursue, and the word pursue means that they plan on overtaking those things that they're going to pursue. But this scripture is in reference to quitting. This scripture is in reference to giving up. This scripture is in reference to those types of things. As a matter of fact, I actually uh, uh, looked up some of the words that were used uh, in translation. And both weariness and faint in this scripture represents a point where actions and motions begin to proceed. And I thought about this. Paul is talking about a point where actions and motions begin to proceed, a point where we are no longer pursuing, we are no longer looking for the things of the Lord, we are no longer worried about doing anything good, we've turned south, we have failure in our heart, and we're not concerned about the things of the Lord because we're disgusted, and we're no longer worried about those good things, and now we're moving towards a bad attitude and a bad spirit about the things of the Lord, and we begin to do evil. That is what this scripture is in reference to. The scripture previous to this says you will reap what you sow. So there may be a point when we're physically tired where we reach that point where we're no longer just physically tired, but now my attitude has changed, now my heart has changed, that I'm no longer caring about the good things of the Lord. I no longer want to be a part of those things. I no longer trust in those things. Be not weary in well-doing. I no longer... Why? I'm being more like the men of Sukkoth, where I'm not going to do that which is right. The Word of God says, if you know to do something right and you don't do it, it is sin to you. 
So now because I'm tired, because I'm pursuing and I'm trying to chase after these things, but I'm burnt out, I've reached a point where things change and I'm proceeding in a different direction. And the word of God says you are going to reap those things that you sow. It's a point where actions or emotions precede a breaking or a cracking by the separation of the parts to fail in heart. I don't want to get that far if I'm tired. Amen? I don't want to get that discouraged. The men of Sakuth and Penuel knew to do good, but they wouldn't do it because they'd already reached that point. I'm faint, yet I'm pursuing. If I've reached that point today, where I'm starting to be upset about things and I'm starting to, to be discouraged, God is faithful and quick and just to show His mercy upon each and every one of us. In Jeremiah 22, it says, Return ye backslidden children, and I will heal your backslidings. Behold, we come unto thee, for thou art the Lord our God. Micah 7, verse 18, Who is like God unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgressions of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever, because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again, he will have compassion on us, he will subdue our iniquities, and he will cast their sins into the depths of the sea. God is faithful to forgive us our sins if we will confess. Amen? But I'm not saying anybody's at that point yet. Praise the Lord. But let's be honest. Sometimes we get tired. I'm the only one, right? Sometimes we get tired. In the midst of the victory, in the midst of the valley. But Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And what? I will give you rest. See, the rest and the rejuvenation and the refreshing does not come from the men of Sukkoth or the men of Penuel. It comes from the Lord. And the Lord gave the strength to Gideon's 300 that they could pursue the 15,000 and they overcame the two kings of Midian. Isaiah 28 and 12 to whom he said, this is the rest wherein ye may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing that ye would not hear. It's the Spirit of the Lord that gives us rest. Amen? It's the Holy Ghost. That's the rest that I need if I'm tired today. That's where I trust. Will I hear? If I was to tell you, that the Holy Ghost is here today. And He sees and recognizes everything that you're going through, knows your struggle, knows your pursuits, knows everything that you're warring against. If I told you the Holy Ghost was here and that He has come to minister to your heart, would you hear? Would you let the Spirit of the Lord minister to your heart? And let him restore your soul. The psalmist said in the 23rd Psalm, The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in the green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, and thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. It continues on, hey, you know, the Lord prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemy. Think about this for, for let's just focus on this. If God is your shepherd, you don't want... Do you realize what the, the psalmist is saying here? He is going to bring you to green pastures, but he can't make you eat. 
He's going to bring you beside the still waters, but He is not going to force you to drink. He is going to move you down paths of righteousness. And though those paths of righteousness and the still waters and the green pastures may end up being in the valley of the shadow of death, there's still paths of righteousness there. There's still green pastures there. There's still water there for you to restore your soul there in the middle of the valley of the shadow of death. The word of God says, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me in the valley of the shadow of death beside the still waters next to the green pastures. Do you know what the staff and the rod of the Lord is? That is the chastening of God's Spirit. Because what does the shepherd do with the rod and the staff? When the sheep begin to go off the path, he taps the sheep this way. And because I'm such a stubborn sheep, I start, really, I'm going this way because this looks really good over here. And the shepherd has to pop me a little harder. That's what the staff and the rod is for. To be comforted by the rebuke of the Lord. Think about that. To be comforted by the chastening. Whom do I love? Those that I chastise. Why? Because I want you to be restored and you need to go this way. And you need to go that way. And it doesn't matter what the circumstance it is. It doesn't matter what the situation is. It doesn't matter if it's the valley of the shadow of death. It doesn't matter if you're in the presence of all your enemies. Do you know what the Lord does in the presence of all your enemies? He prepares a table in the presence of your enemies. And I want you to know, church, that when God prepares a table before you, do you know that He is not a tease? He doesn't set all those things out for you so you could just long for them. He sets them out there because he expects you to come and partake of them. The pastor made a joke last week. If you don't buy the ticket, you're never going to win the lottery. If you don't eat out of the green pasture and you don't drink out of the still waters and you don't receive from the table of the Lord you're never going to be restored. If I told you God prepared a table for you up here today, would you hear? What are you pursuing? What are you pursuing? It says in Jeremiah, for I will restore health unto thee. I will heal thee of your wounds, saith the Lord. Because He loves us. Because we're important to Him. In Philippians, the third chapter, in the 13th verse, verse, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press towards the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> I haven't attained it yet, but Lord, I'm still pursuing. I'm tired, I'm weary, I'm beat up, but I'm not giving up, and I'm still pursuing. You know, the word right there represents there's resistance. If I wasn't pressing, then I could just walk up and I could take the mark, but there's resistance, and so I'm having to press towards it. Which means I'm having to put forth an effort. Which means I'm having to do something. Which means it's taking away my strength. It's utilize, uh, taking away my strength and my power. And I'm beginning to use all my muscles. But it's the Spirit of the Lord. I haven't attained unto it yet. But Paul says, I'm going to forget about all the mistakes I've made in the past. And I'm going to reach for those things that are for me. And I'm going to press towards the mark of the prize calling of God. I'm going to partake of the table of the Lord. I'm going to be in the green pastures. I'm going to drink of the still waters. Regardless of everything that's around me, I am still pursuing the prize of the high calling of the Lord. I'm not stopping here because God won this 
great battle. I'm pursuing to win the war. I'm pursuing the Midianites across the Jordan because God's going to give me the kings. And the victory is so great that the word of God says they could not lift their heads up again. And they could not pursue or come after the children of the Lord again. If I told you the Lord prepared a table before you today, would you want to come and partake of it? What are you pursuing? You know what? We're running out of time, but you know what? I'm pursuing the victory for my pastor. God has given us to the pastor no more seizures, right? I'm still pursuing that God raise him up so he gets beyond this nausea and these migraine headaches. Can God not do it if he did this, right? I'm not giving up and calling an end to it. I may be tired, but I'm still pursuing that before the Lord. You know what I'm pursuing? I'm pursuing for Sister Betty to have her numbers be zero. You know what I'm pursuing? I'm pursuing for Sister Cindy when she has that next scan that there's nothing. And we get up here and she shows it again and there's nothing on there. I'm pursuing that Mother Nunes when she has those tests run that they come up negative what are you pursuing in the house of the Lord I'm pursuing for those that have surgery that they be restored I'm pursuing some of those things that I'm not going to speak and you're hearing personal private things in my household and I'm not giving up because God can give me the war and not just the battle if I said God has prepared a table would you come and partake of it? I may be tired. I may have lost some of my vigor, but the Spirit of the Lord will give me rest. The Spirit of the Lord will give me strength. Isaiah 40, hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, feigneth not, neither is weary. There is no searching his understanding. Hallelujah. He giveth power to the faint and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall be fiery, weary and faint, and the young shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with the wings of eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Praise the Lord. Faint yet pursuing. What are you pursuing today? The word of God says, but they that endureth unto the end shall be saved. Endure Pursue until the end of the war, not the end of the battle. And God can give it all to us. Praise the name of the Lord as we're standing in the house of the Lord. As the singers and musicians are coming up, I want to close with these last set of scriptures. And I want you to think about this. Exodus, the 33rd chapter, beginning with the 13th verse. Now, therefore, I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. And he said, my presence shall go with thee, and I will give you rest. Then he said unto him, if thy presence go not with me, Carry us not up hence, for wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. And he said, beseech thee, show me thy glory. 
Having said this, meaning this, the Lord knows each and every one of us by name. And we have found grace in his sight. And Moses is speaking to the Lord and says, Lord, if you don't go with us, then I don't want to go. You know, we spoke a couple Wednesday nights ago. Lord, don't take away your, your free spirit from me. Amen. Amen. Lord, if you're not going to go with us, then I am just like everybody else. I am nothing without you. But Lord, if, you, if we have found grace in your sight, be with us. That's my prayer today. Lord, be with me. Because it doesn't matter what the warfare is. It doesn't matter what the battle is. I'm different because I am with the Lord. I need the Lord. I need His Spirit to be inside of me. I need His loving power to come over me. I need to partake of the table that He spread. If I have found grace in Your sight, Lord, show me Your glory. I'm not like Moses. I don't, Lord, you don't have to show me your face. You don't have to show me what you look like. I'm not looking for you, God, to set me in, in the cleft of the, of, the, of the mountain and for your spirit to, to cover me with your hand and I get to see your hinder parts. I'm not even that special, Lord, but I am presumptuous enough to ask God to show me your glory right here at this altar. I'm presumptuous enough Show me your glory, Lord, and renew my strength. Amen. I'm that presumptuous because God loves me.